for you in the uh, chair racks. If you would please find Matthew chapter 12 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll begin, uh, or we'll finish part of a three-part message. I thought it would be two parts uh, two weeks ago when we began it, but a two-part message that really um, deals with the person or personality of God the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I have found that one of the most practical areas of preaching in the Scripture, one of the most practical areas of preaching is about the ministry and the work of God the Holy Spirit. It's too bad, isn't it, that in, uh, in Bible churches, Bible preaching churches, that we don't emphasize very much the Holy Spirit, the person and the work of God the Holy Spirit. I believe that much of the cause for that, I think there's two reasons for it. One is because when you really come to understand being filled with the Spirit of God and having God's uh, presence and God working out of you, there, there's a requirement for submission and surrender, ultimately, and being Spirit-filled. And I think that most of us, this is a judgmental statement. I, I'm okay with being judgmental, aren't you? You okay with me being, making judgmental? I, I'd say this jokingly. This is a judgmental statement, but this would, this would be something that I think would reflect most of our attitudes. Uh, most of us care a great deal about what people think. Now, you say, well, I don't care what people think about me. Well, probably you do more than you realize. Probably it matters or affects you what people think about you more than you realize. And I would say that with regard to our Christian lives, it's more important to many of us, and I would say probably to most of us, what people think about us spiritually than it actually is or than it actually occurs to us about what God thinks about us spiritually. I'm just tell you something, friend. I am what God thinks I am, not what you think I am. You may be unimpressed, or you may be impressed with me, but God is neither. God knows me, knows my heart, and He sees what man doesn't see. Years ago, I was very impressed with the passage of Scripture where God was choosing or showing Samuel who was going to be king of Israel instead of Saul. Do you remember that? And He sent him to the sons of Jesse to anoint them. Every one of Jesse's sons, when they came before Samuel, Samuel said, God, this has got to be him. I mean, look at him. I mean, you talk about a sharp guy. You talk about a, a good-looking guy. You talk about a guy who looks like a king. And every one of them, God said, no, it's not him. So I've rejected them. They're not, that's not them. And then he said, here's why. For the man seeth not as the Lord seeth. For the man, man looketh on the outward appearance. And by the way, there's no condemnation. I would be oh, look on the outward appearance of people. That's all you can see is the outward appearance. But the outward appearance can be deceiving. It can be real. It can be actual. But it can also deceive us, can't it? In other words, if you knew what people were looking for, it would be easy to look like what they're looking for, wouldn't it be? And if you're the kind of person that just, you know, thinks that you can see what's inside on the basis of what's outside, you'll be easily deceived. But the Bible says that God sees the heart. He looks on the heart. So God knows what's in a person. Isn't that comforting, actually, the truth of that? Really is comforting to be able to just rest in full assurance saying, God, as you know my heart, you know exactly what I actually am. Sometimes, though, I think it could be convicting, couldn't it? God, this is what people think about me but this is what you know. What does God know about you? What does God know about your heart? And what does God's Spirit know about you? So I mentioned in, in the beginning, we've been looking at the series on, first of all, the example we saw. It's a series on being Spirit-filled, or a series on the topic of God's Holy Spirit, God's Spirit. And so we looked at the various ministries of God's Spirit, we saw as well that there's a difference between being sealed and uh, being indwelt in the personal ministry that God's Spirit has with what we actually saw in Acts, which is God's power, the power of God's Spirit. That is being empowered by God's Holy Spirit. I don't shy away from the term baptism of the Spirit. There are, 
I think, generally speaking, Baptists and folks that would be fundamental Bible believers have kind of, they're afraid of the term baptism of the Holy Spirit because it has been misdefined. Uh, and I'm not bashing this morning, but it's been misdefined by charismatics who make baptism of the Holy Spirit to be that which causes babbling or speaking in uh, unknown languages, which is in contrast to what the Bible teaches, which is speaking in known languages. When a believer, if a believer were to speak in tongues in a biblical sense, he would speak in a known language and have someone who knows the language actually interpret for him. And we have some folks in the room today, I don't know how many various languages are represented, but there are various languages represented here today. I think probably at least, uh, at least Spanish, at least English, at least Creole, some Portuguese, and I don't know what other languages different folks here may know. Charlie knows like 30 languages, but he's very, very uh, weak in Swahili. He can't hardly speak Swahili at all. So don't address him in Swahili today. He'll barely know what you're saying. Uh, but we know languages. And if you knew a language and you knew that I did and I spoke to you in your language, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? And it could be a sign, couldn't it? It could be you'd say, well, if he can't speak the language and yet he can speak the language, maybe God's speaking. Right? So that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Believers from all the parts all around the nations, uh, or all the different nations, had come to Israel on the day of Pentecost for that spiritual holiday or spiritual uh, uh, feast. And when the disciples got up and preached, they preached to the people in their known languages. And they were, the Bible says, unlearned and ignorant men. In other words, they, they weren't educated. And it was known that they didn't know any other languages, and so what did people think? Well, they said, well, they must be drunk. I never know a person who is drunk that became more intelligent. Uh, <laughs> and that was kind of Peter's point. He said, these men are not drunk, and as you suppose, it's about the third hour of the day. And then he, Peter got up, and he, speaked, he spoke the gospel, preached the gospel. The greatest sermon in the Bible, I believe, was preached on the day of Pentecost. And the result of it the, was, that the re, was that conviction came to the very individuals who had rejected Christ, who cried crucify Him, who had demanded that Barabbas, a uh, insurrectionist and a thief and a murderer, uh, be released instead of Jesus, and the ones who had been happy to see Christ crucified on the cross, those very individuals, the Bible says, were pricked to their hearts and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, hey, he said, repent. Be baptized. Repent. Turn from your rejecting Jesus. Turn to Jesus. And he said, the promise is unto you and to your children and to them that are all far off. In other words, you could be filled with the same spirit as well. And folks are far off. Who's that? That's weans. I've been in Tennessee this last week and they make up uh, words with pronouns. Usans, weans. That means us. And so the promise in the Bible in Acts is that you can be empowered. You can be filled with God's Holy Spirit. And we saw, first example, and I, this is introductory, but I've been away for a week, so I have to remind myself what I preached so that <laughs> I won't re-preach the same thing again. We saw, that, uh, uh, we saw that Christ was the example of being filled with the Spirit. We know that Jesus is God, that He was that part of God who was literally the physical force of creation. He's God the Son who, when God ultimately judges the wicked in this world, will be the one who speaks the destruction of those who oppose Him. And so we see that Jesus has great power as God. He's not limited. He's not a weak uh, person of God. He's not the weaker person of God. He's God the Son. He has all the authority, all the power that is that God has. But when He came and had His earthly ministry on this earth, Jesus laid aside His power of God and He worked only through the power of God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. And remember the two statements that we said that Jesus made that would seem at first that we would contradict? Remember the amazing statements? I hope you do. I, I, I believe the repetition, age, and learning also irritates people. But let's, let's repeat it just a little bit uh, so we can remember. Remember when Jesus said, Greater things than ye, these shall ye do because I go unto my Father. Anytime Jesus says, You're going to do greater things than I did, I'm going to say, Not so, Lord. I mean, I feel like Peter, right? Oh, no, 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 no. I never do greater things than you did, Jesus. And yet we see that what God calls greatness isn't what we call greatness. When we think of greatness, we think of supernatural, right? We think of things like walking on the water, turning water into the wine, raising the dead, healing the sick, uh, stopping the winds and the waves, uh, 
making mountains fall. We think of uh, stopping the sun, that sort of thing, right? In other words, if I were today to say, okay, folks, we're going to have church all day, but don't worry about it because I'm going to stop the sun through God's power. And the sun were stopped. You'd say, "Get started again, Pastor. You've already gone too long." <laughs> no, uh, but if, if I were to do something, would that impress you? If I were to say, "I'm going to stop the sun," and I did, you know, God stopped the sun different times. Would that impress you if I were to do that? Yeah. You'd be impressed, wouldn't you? Would it impress God? No. He made the sun. Right. Okay. So when Jesus said, "Greater works than these shall you do," God's not impressed by someone walking on water. Do you realize how much bigger, more powerful, more awesome God is than that? I mean, Jesus wasn't walking on water like, hey, let me, let me try something. This is amazing. He made the water. He made the limitations that we have for walking on water. Jesus wasn't amazed by anything He ever did, was He? No, not at all. And you know, this is key. We need to get this. When we desire to be Spirit-filled, we need to realize that greatness needs to be thought of in terms of God's definition for greatness, not in man's terms. I believe that one of the reasons that we're so weak when it comes to God's power in our lives is because we desire greatness so that men could look at us and say, whoa, wow, instead of so that God would say, whoa, wow. Isn't it true? Isn't it so? I mean, how many of us would like to, you know, have a, you know, a uh, essential oils party or a uh, or a plexus party, have everybody over and then heal everyone there? That'd get around, wouldn't it? <laughs> wouldn't it be cool if you, hey, you know, we're gonna have a get together, we're gonna uh, have a Tupperware party. These parties crack me up uh, that people have. I'm sorry if you're a party, uh, one of these, uh, one one of those people. Uh, what's that? My father was vice president. Was he really? How do you like that? God, he's never coming back. <laughs> Pastor, you made fun of Tupperware people. No, not really. Uh, but supposing we have one of those parties, and you know, at the party, we said, okay, guys, I want to show you some amazing things about Tupperware. Before we do that, does anybody have any ailments? Yeah, you know, I've you know, uh, never been able to walk. They can walk. Heal the deaf. I mean, all the things Jesus did, that'd be pretty amazing, wouldn't it? You think word would get out about your Tupperware? Hey, go to the Tupperware party. <laughs> go to Patty's house. <laughs> Whatever. You don't understand what I'm saying. In other words, we're impressed by things, but we're not really impressed by things God's impressed with. What is it that God wants to accomplish? What is it that God wants to get supernatural power for? If you study the Acts of the Apostles, which really is the Acts of the Holy Spirit, the thing that will impress you is that God is able to take through the power of His Holy Spirit that God is able to use the human element to preach the gospel, to see people come to Jesus, and to see literally lives changed. And if you've been born again, you know what, you know what the power of the Holy Spirit is, actually. You know what God can do. When God's Holy Spirit first shows you your need for sin, remember the first time you had Holy Spirit conviction? Man, I felt like I was going to explode. I'm serious. I'm serious. Charlie calls it the squeeze. You ever have, I mean, I'm just telling you now, when the Spirit of God convicts me about wrong or whatever, gives me conviction, and I feel like my heart's going to stop. I mean, it's just like, uh, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Like, it's just like, and it, that's not, that, that's not made up. That's literally the person of God in me, working in me, speaking in my heart, in my life. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? So the first time I remember that I had conviction, and then when you're born again, and then the first time God's Spirit empowers you to preach the gospel, my friend, it's, it's something like nothing else. And that's what Peter did on the day of Pentecost and the rest of the apostles. They got up and they preached the gospel. And when Jesus said, greater things than these shall you do, that was fulfilled the first day of Pentecost and fulfilled time after time after time after that because even Jesus himself did not have the results in preaching the gospel that came as a result of the empowering of the Holy Spirit of God. That seems like blasphemy to say something like that, doesn't it? Jesus said it. Jesus said it. What was the other statement about the power of the Spirit that we would think on the surface would not be true or we would contradict. Anybody remember? It is blank for you that I go. Expedient. The word expedient means superior, better. Jesus told the disciples who had Him on a daily basis to follow, to guide, to lead, to instruct, 
to provide for. He told the disciples, you're going to be better off without me. If I'm a disciple, I'm going to say, not so, Lord. <laughs> Things are not better without you than they are with you. But he said, if I go not away, the Comforter who will not come unto you. Literally, my friend, get this. You and I do not live in an age that is inferior to the time that the disciples live with the bodily present Son of God. Think on that. Jesus said it's better that I go away because the type of ministry that the Holy Ghost has, the Holy Spirit of God, will have with you is actually superior to the ministry that I have. Uh, when the disciples were sent away from Jesus, man, we're, you know they were separated, right? From Jesus. When God lives in you, God the Son lives in you, we have Christ in us. Literally, you're never alone. You're never without comfort. Always, 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 the Comforter, that is the Holy Ghost, is with us. He's not angry. He has to go to work. <laughs> in case you're wondering, he should slam the door when he leaves. <laughs> uh, okay. That's our introduction. Let's make a point. One point left to make. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12 first. We'll read it and then we'll read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, Matthew 12 verse 31. Uh, this is after the... Uh, it would have been the Pharisees had come to Jesus and they accused Jesus of casting out the devil by the power of the devil. Jesus said in verse 31, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men, and whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. In verse 35, Jesus said, A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of the heart bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. We preach this passage of Scripture I guess it was three weeks ago in our first part of this message, and the conclusion that we came to really had to do with that last statement. By your words, you're justified. By your words, you're condemned. And ultimately, that is the context. Now, you can take a lot of people preach, you know, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart, but they preach it outside of the context that it actually comes in, which is that they have accused Jesus of doing the work of the devil by the power of the devil. They have said that the devil did the work that the Spirit of God did, and Jesus said that's blasphemy. And ultimately what he said is that your words have shown what's in your heart. When you say that casting out a devil is the work of the devil, you display who it is that you're working for. In other words, when a devil is cast out, is that good or bad? If you oppose devils being cast out of somebody, whose team are you on? That's Jesus' point. If you're against devils being cast out of people, who's, who are you working for? Who's against devils being cast out? Who doesn't want to give up devil's territory? The devil. The devil. So you're on the devil's team. And Jesus said, your words have condemned you. Isn't it true a lot of times you can kind of figure out what's going on with somebody the more they talk? You ever had somebody against something you just couldn't figure out why? I have. I've had people oppose things in the ministry, and I just think, well, how in the world could you oppose? We're going to go soul winning. I just don't think we ought to be soul winning. You know, I just think, hey, start giving reason after reason after reason after reason after why. You figure out why. Okay, here's what's going on. Your words are what condemn you. And Jesus said, He said, you know, what you've said shows what you are, shows what you're motivated. You're not some pious, God fearing individual who is concerned lest the devil cast out devils. You're an individual who's concerned because the devil lost ground. And you're on his team. And so your words condemn you. Okay, we've seen that God the Holy Spirit, though, we've seen that God the Holy Spirit is a person. Last week when we looked at grieving the Holy Spirit of God, <coughs> go ahead and turn to 1 Thessalonians 5. I just wanted to segue from our, from our text that we've begun our series or this message in to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, which is the last place we'll go today. 
we saw that God's Spirit is a person, and like a person, He is able to be blasphemed, and He's able, as well, to be grieved. Uh, I didn't use the illustration last week, but uh, trending on social media has been a story which I actually verified is uh, a lady really did write the article. You know, sometimes you hear these moving, touching stories and you just think, I wonder if that's real or not. So I usually research the stories to find out if they're real. And uh, I would just say this, I'll qualify this by saying I don't know what the motive would be of a woman to paint herself in a very bad light. But a lady did write it. And, and again, this is a tearjerker of an article. You can look it up yourself. I'm not going to read it. But a lady by the name, I believe it was of Angela Morell, wrote an article. And it was titled something like, um, Why I Regret My Last Words With My Husband. Here's essentially what happened. Her husband was working too much, and it really irritated her. So he came home late, and she blessed him out for it. It would be a nice way of saying it. She really yelled at him, told him he was working too much, and she was sick and tired of it. And she said, you know what, for that, you can sleep on the couch. This is my summary of it. You can read the article. I'm not making it up. Uh, you can sleep on the couch. She came in the morning, and he was laying on the couch where he'd fallen asleep, and he died. So her last words to her husband were, she just really yelled at him for working too much. She found out the reason he was working so much. I think it was Prague he wanted to take her to for a honeymoon or a vacation kind of a thing. So he was working extra hours so he could take her on a romantic getaway trip. And then she got angry with him for it, chewed him out. Last thing she said to him were mean things, and he died. And she wrote something like, be nice to your husbands while you have them, or what I would say if my husband were still here, or what I wouldn't say. It's you know, a real tear jerky, I'll be honest with you. I mean, this is a really sad, this is a terrible story. Well, I, I checked it out, and I think it's actually true. There are some caveats to it. I think that if you know who LeVar Ball is, I think she's sort of like the female of our ball. In other words, she may want attention. Now, this is not, I'm just telling you, here's why I think that. She's now dating her husband's brother, like a couple of months later, and they're in a relationship, and her family's, their family's not talking to her. So you kind of wonder, sometimes you wonder about how sincere people are about things, or whether, you know, it's just a great story, and she got internet famous over it. I don't know. And again, it's, just, it's, it's sad. I'm sad for her. I don't it doesn't even matter what my opinion about her is anyway. She is what God knows her to be. And so, but my point would be that, can you imagine, can you imagine the grief that she feels on the basis of the grief that she caused? Yeah, you can imagine being the wife, just imagine that everything is, is the way it appears on the surface. Just imagine you're the wife who lost it with your husband because you're emotional or whatever caused it. But imagine you did that, and then you thought, I wonder if I caused his heart attack. I wonder if I grieved him to the point that something happened, he had a stroke, or I don't know what happened actually. But I wonder if what I did caused that to happen for that person. You ever met somebody, they have such a temper that you could set them off and they could have a stroke? I've known people like that. I mean, literally, veins pop out in their necks, you know, and they turn all boiling red. And you know, and, and you think, man, I better not make them mad. I might be the guy that kills them. You know, I wouldn't want to do that. You know, another gre in other words, grieve them. I think that one of the most amazing attributes, getting getting serious, I've used a couple of illustrations to talk about grieving, but I'm getting very, very serious. I think one of the most amazing things about about us and God is that we actually have the ability to grieve him. You ever think about that? You know, we are so concerned with putting us first in in today's society, aren't we? I mean, you you just need to do you need to take care of yourself, right? Just, you know what? Ultimately, the first thing I need to do is I need to look out for myself. Whatever in that relationship happens with that person, whatever they think, whatever, 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 whatever. But I have to make sure that I'm okay first. You know, you've heard that, haven't you? Make sure, because if you're not okay, then nothing's okay. And I'll be quite honest with you, my friend. I believe when it comes to God, the Holy Spirit, we're more concerned with our feelings than we are with His. You ever met somebody that's just they're really concerned about feelings? It manifests itself in one of my favorite statements. I love this one. If you analyze it, it's, it's, it's really um, it's a disingenuous statement that doesn't really make sense when you think about it. You ever heard this? It's not what 
you said. It's how you said it. Right. Now, that's dumb. I think my wife can hear. I don't know if she's used the word dumb. But that's dumb, isn't it? If you think about it. In other words, the content or the truth doesn't make any difference. But how I feel about what you said does. Right? In other words, the way I feel is more valid than than whatever reality is. That's actually what that statement means, isn't it? Am I wrong about that? It's actually, it isn't. Now, I understand truth and love. The Bible teaches that. I understand how you say things. Hey, listen, bozo. You need to get right. Okay, you know, maybe that's not... I understand how you say things. I'm not saying how you say things doesn't matter. But what matters more than how you say it is what's said. What I need to be concerned about is not how I feel about something. I need to be concerned with whether or not it's actually true or not. If there's something that's terrible that's true about me, that's the matter for concern, not how I feel about what's said. You know, I believe in many instances, you and I feel so hurt by the audacity of the third person of God causing us conviction. Do you hear me? What is one of the ministries of God's Spirit? To convince us. To show us, first of all, our sin. Now, let me ask you a question. Does that make anybody feel good to know? I'm a dirty, rotten scoundrel, and if God were to judge me honestly, if God were to judge me, He wouldn't judge my good works, He'd judge my sin. Does that make anybody feel good about themselves? You know, a lot of people hate God's Spirit because He convicts them of sin. Now, to whose benefit is it to show somebody that they're a sinner? It's their benefit. The best thing that ever happened to me was for me to realize that not only am I a sinner, but that I actually deserve God's judgment. I'm not a good person. The best things that God ever showed me is that I'm not a good person. I'm not. I am not my best. I'm my worst when it comes to God's judgment. Or is the good things that I do, hey, God's not going to judge that. It's the evil that I do. And that's the reality. That's the way I stand before God. God doesn't judge good. He judges evil. So it's very good for me to realize I'm in trouble. It was good for me to realize that God is much better than me. God is perfect and His standard is perfection. It was good for me to know that. And then when I realized that in spite of what I am, God loved me. Christ died for me. And God was freely offering the gift of His Son. I thought, man, it's a good thing God showed me I needed Jesus. Because now, my friend, I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. And I literally am. I literally am perfect in God's eyes. When God looks at me, He does not, He's not naive about what I was, but He knows what His sin, what His Son was when that His blood is covering my, from me from my sins. The best thing that ever happened to me was for the Holy Spirit of God to show me I needed a Savior. We all do, whether we acknowledge it or not, but you know some of us don't like being don't be like being convicted. As believers, I believe that oftentimes we are more concerned with fulfilling the desires of our flesh than we are with how the God living in us feels about it. Right? Isn't it true? This is this is something that would be controversial here today, and it's not meant uh, to be my opinion versus yours. And I don't, I, don't, I don't have an opinion about you if you disagree with me on it. I know what the Bible says. I'm very confident of my opinion. The Bible says wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Okay, that to me is plainly spoken. Strong drink is plainly, um, plainly explain what it is in the Scripture. Okay, you may say, well, Pastor, I just don't agree with you on that. I don't... I honestly don't have a position. I agree with God on it. I'll be quite honest with you. So you may not like that. But I've done this a number of times. I've preached weddings for Christians who wanted to have like a reception and they wanted to have an open bar. Not because they wanted to drink, but because their family did. And their concern. I'm not, I'm not being silly. I'm being serious about this. If you can relate to it, you'll understand that I'm being serious. If you can't relate to it, I'm just telling you I'm not being silly. Their concern was that their family would be offended that they wouldn't have drinking at their wedding. And they were more concerned about that than they were about 
whether or not the Spirit of God had an opinion about it. Get it? You see what I'm saying? In other words, they, they said, well, you know, I just, I, I'm just not willing to offend my family by not having alcohol at my wedding. Because I don't want to offend them or grieve them. But actually, who is grieved by it? Who would actually be grieved by that? God's Spirit would be. And friend, I just want us to realize God's a person. His Spirit's a person. He lives in you. And when you grieve Him, it affects you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. We looked at the statements, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, grieve not the Spirit of God. And uh, this, so today I just want to look at this simple point, and you say, you're taking a long time. Well, it's because I don't have much to say when I actually get to my content. Okay, folks, so here we go. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19, the Bible says, quench not the Spirit. Now, I said last week that both of these terse commands, these just simply stated commands, they have a context, actually. Brother Charlie's been uh, teaching about the local church. He's spent a lot of times in Ephes a lot of time in Ephesians because it really talks about the church, the body. Uh, Ephesians does. There's a context in, uh, in really in chapter four, where we're told this is how you ought to walk as a Christian. You've told we've told you how you ought to live, what your conversation should be, how you ought to live for Jesus. But now we're in a series of terse commands like rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, um, in everything give thanks, for this will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesying. Literally, you could divorce these statements from their context and they would have their own context. You get what I'm saying? Of course, I have a real problem with people taking Scriptures out of context. But these verses actually have their own context. Quench not the Spirit means quench not the Spirit. It doesn't have to fit in with all the other uh, content in Ephesians to have its context. Literally, it's in a series of commands on how to be a good Christian or how to please God, how to walk in a way that pleases God. And one of the things that we're told in the context is quench not the Spirit. And it has its own meaning. You don't have to read back a few verses Figure out, well, what, what are we talking about? What's the ministry of the Spirit? What's the... No, it means quench not the Spirit. It means what it means. There are several references in the New Testament to the word quench, not this particular statement, but quench not the Spirit. One of the references would be to the gentleness of our Savior. Remember when the Bible says, a bruised reed, will he not break? And a smoking flax, will he not quench? And it's a reference to an Old Testament prophecy about the meekness of the manner of the Savior, Jesus, how harmless he was. Literally, Jesus Christ was so harmless that if a flax, you know, just a, 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 a fiber were smoking, He's so gentle that He would not quench it. What would happen if a, if a piece of cloth were on fire and you threw water? Well, literally, the water would blow it apart. The water would destroy it. Um, I think of this in today's vernacular. I haven't studied the word uh, for quenching a, a, a smoking flax. I think of Coleman lanterns. Remember the Coleman lanterns that had the wick in them? You ever, were you ever the kid that your dad said, don't touch the wick, and you touch the wick? Not, not when it's hot, but when it's cold. Remember what happened if you touched a wick in a Coleman lantern? It just disintegrated, right? just disappears. If you have an experience to go buy yourself a Coleman lantern, light the thing up, and then touch the wick after. Everybody needs to break at least one Coleman lantern wick. Uh, but, you know, in other words, that would be like a smoking flax. So the idea of it would be, it would be so damaged that anything that touched or affected it would destroy it. And that really is a picture of the gentleness of our Savior. Quenching. Quenching a, a smoking flax. Literally, if you were to quench it, it would just disintegrate. You ever see a piece of paper in a fire and you, like, you can actually still read the words on it? What happens if you touch it? Throw water on it. It's just gone. It just disintegrates. That's the idea of quench. Quenching a fire or quenching something would be to put it out and the idea would be it would have barely a fire in it, but what you do to it actually just devastates or destroys. There would be a couple of other instances in the Scripture using the word quench. But the word quench always has a context of fire. It always has a context of burning. And the fire or the burning in us is God's Spirit. There are many references in the Scripture to it, His Spirit speaking with our spirit. 
of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. And God's Spirit is a Spirit in us, and a harsh word literally has the ability to crush or to quench or put out the fire in us. Some Christians just wonder, you know, why don't I care? What happened to my fire? I used to be so excited. I used to be so thrilled. Man, you told me we're going to go here preaching all day and Pastor Price is going to go on and on. You'd say, well, good. Now I just think, man, it's lunchtime. Shut up. You know, I don't want to hear it. Um, I used to be that when I thought about people who were not born again, that I realized that their eternal soul was lost and I was concerned about anyone I knew that I knew didn't have eternal life and now even though that's such an important matter now even though it's such a big deal I just don't it doesn't affect me you can talk about weighty spiritual matters and they're of little or no concern to me why well friend I believe because we're guilty of putting out the fire quenching the Holy Spirit of God literally God, I don't want to hear it. Husbands, you probably understand this better uh, than people who wouldn't be married. You know what some words do to your wife, don't you? Just some words, some things. You could just say something uh, to someone, and it literally has the ability. It doesn't have to be yelled. It doesn't have to be said in a mean tone. But literally, uh, something would just crush your wife. Just a word. Just, a, just a, something that's said. It literally could have the force of just crushing someone. Some people are do that, those sort of things on purpose. Some people use words to destroy others. Just use words to hurt. They find out an area that's sensitive and they take delight in actually crushing or saying something. I have... I'll be honest with you, there's, I think there's probably no worse experience I've ever had in my life than saying something that quenches somebody or crushes someone. Um, I try to think of something that would be that for my wife, and I'm not bragging, but I'm just proud to say I can't think of something that I could say that would hurt my wife because I don't try to think of things that would hurt my wife. In other words, you just, man... I, okay, here's one. Here's a for instance. <laughs> Before we were married, I was having a casual conversation with my wife, and we were talking about debt. We wanted to get married, and we was po. In other words, we didn't have much. And I was working as an assistant pastor in Delray Beach. I, I got a salary of $125 a week, which was actually plenty for me. I lived on it. I made $125 a week. I had a Toyota pickup. Uh, I had a Chevelle at home, but I didn't. You know, I didn't it cost me, like I think, uh, $120 a month for insurance. And I stayed in the house of somebody in our church. So actually, I thrived on $125 a week. I did pretty well. I didn't have to spend very much. I was saving uh, for marriage, for a wedding ring and so forth. And, uh, but what I did with my finances was pretty important. I couldn't just blow money, so I had to be pretty frugal. My wife was a Christian school teacher. She had moved to Virginia at the time. And I was talking about debt. And I said something. Uh, and I, I just I didn't think about what I said, but I said something that really crushed her, really, really hurt her. She had a car. Uh, I work on cars, and you've seen the things that I drive, and so you know that I'm not amazed by a brand new vehicle. I'm actually not really amazed by any vehicle unless it's a Volkswagen diesel that gets great fuel economy. Uh, that's the only thing I care about about vehicles. And I drive ragged out things, and it's you know it's not uncommon when I'm driving somewhere for the vehicle that I'm driving to break. And what do I do when it breaks? I fix it. And then we go on. So that's how I live. And I've always thought it's nuts for people to pay uh, for a new vehicle. I, if you've got new vehicles, this is, this is my economy, the economy I live in. Okay, not yours. This is me. This is who I am. Okay, but I think it's nuts to buy a new vehicle because the moment you drive it off the lot, you've lost like, you know, minimum of five, six thousand dollars in depreciation. I mean, when you buy it, the fact that it's titled in your name makes it worth less than you paid for it. And to me, personally, unless you're a billionaire or you're wealthy enough that it doesn't matter, to me it's just like a gross uh, misappropriation of funds. Something else that's crazy I hate is paying interest. I'm just an anti-interest person. I believe what the Bible says, the borrower is servant to the lender, 
And so I'm building my case so you folks know I'm right about this. Okay, so you don't get angry with me. Uh, but, uh, you know, so my dad had a used car dealerships, and so we used to sell nice cars and drive junk cars. You know, that's, yeah, let that's somebody else pay for that. It's, you know, four years from now, it'll be junk. But they can go have a fancy, brand new looking thing. I've got my, my uh, great grandma's 1971 Chevelle with the original purchase receipts, and I've got the original order, or my grandpa, he paid, he bought a new car, didn't he? My great granddad paid cash or wrote a check for it, you know, and I have the receipts and all that stuff. And it's in really pretty pristine condition for the age. It's really nice. My 71 Chevelle is nicer than most people's five year old car. I mean, and when I drive down the street in my 71 Chevelle, people are like, oh, cool, 71 Chevelle. They see your five year old car, they think that thing's destined for the boneyard, you know, with a piece of junk. So I just look at cars that way. You buy a new car, I think, yeah, it won't be very long until your car's old. You say, well, Pastor, I'd like to have a warranty on my car. Well, good for you, you know? Uh, and so you just pay, I, I could just pay to have my car fixed. And it's all the same thing. You know, just, it's just how you see things, right? But the thing that gets me is interest. You know what they charge for interest for new vehicles or for used vehicles? Well, my wife had bought a nice used, low mileage used vehicle. She wasn't my wife yet. She bought a low mileage used vehicle and the reason she done it is because she was a single lady and she needed something reliable because she was moving away. She's going to be living in Virginia by herself. She was from Michigan, didn't know anybody there. And she felt like it would be a good idea to have a reliable vehicle. She had a Dodge Neon before that, and it was a piece of junk. And so she, she, bought, uh, she bought a boat. She bought a 95 Chevrolet Caprice, and it had like 20-something thousand miles on it. Leather interior, big, you know, big boat thing. Well, I didn't know she owed money on it. But she did. And I said, man, I just think it's the stupidest thing in the world when people borrow money to buy a car that's just going to be in a junkyard in a couple of years. <laughs> she basically starved herself, <laughs> paid off her car, and then, and then told me I paid my car off. You know? And I realized afterward the words that I had said, it didn't literally just crushed her. Or just like, you know, I think you're unwise financially, whatever, whatever, whatever. I had no intention. You know, I'm just opinionated. You know, I, got, I don't feel like everybody needs to have my opinions, but I do have opinions. And I'm willing to like cut them. I try to cut them loose less than I used to. I do try to be better about it. But I've got an opinion. I don't think, oh, you know, you bought a used car and paid, or you're paying pay, payments and interest on I think you're a terrible person. I actually don't think that at all. I just think it's stupid. And that's a really crushing thing to think about someone you want to marry. Isn't it so? Okay. Now that would be an unintentional thing, but I learned that I need to be very, very careful with how I treat my wife because I don't want to hurt her feelings about something. Right? Wouldn't it be a terrible thing if a husband were to tell his wife your cooking's terrible? Your wife spends all day she made, my wife's learned, don't do this. Don't, don't knock yourself out making something for me. Because what she thinks is my favorite meal probably isn't. I don't have a favorite meal. I just like food. You know? So um, she used to look up special dishes and put a lot of work into making. Like I remember one time she made cashew chicken. It was good. It was delicious. It was really good. But then she realized he doesn't appreciate that any more than he does whatever else. You know? And so... You know, but you know, I would never say, well, you know, I just really don't like that. That was no good. No, my wife spends time making a meal for me. Plus, it's it's a bonus that I kind of pretty much like all food anyway. I'm not gonna say, well, that wasn't good. Some people are just terrible. They're just. I mean, I can't imagine a man after his wife makes a dinner for him or does something special because she wants to please him and demonstrate her love for him to say that wasn't good. That's a really cruel thing to say, actually, isn't it? That would grieve someone. We think a lot about people, we think a lot about ourselves when we think of feelings. And we think very little about God, the Holy Spirit, and that He has feelings. He's a person, and He has feelings. And friend, anytime you and I make a decision to quench Him, how do you quench? Well, He's the fire in you. He's the one that says you ought to. I want to hear it. You know, it would be it would be a really good thing if you did this. I'm not doing that. 
Wives, you know what it's like, don't you, if your husband kind of speaks to you that way? I mean, you're really just trying to be a help. The Holy Spirit's more than just a helper. He's God. But He's been so gentle and so kind as to come and to live in us, to be Jesus Christ in us. I'll just tell you something. If God talks to you, that's kind of a privilege. And we act like He's some kind of annoying little brother or something. God. Christ in us. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? You ever been disrespectful and later on realized it? You know, I didn't, maybe you didn't mean it, but you just didn't think about it. And what I said was, didn't think of the person, I didn't think of the position of the person, and I didn't think of really their kindness to even care about me, to even be concerned with me and my life. But friend, it is a privilege on a grander scale than I could describe to have God's Spirit in us. I could try to tell you how it is that we quench the Spirit of God, but it's probably different for every single one of us. To quench is to put out the fire. To quench is to say no, God, to say I'm not interested, or to even be cruel, or to put Him through things that just crushes Him. But it matters. It matters how we live. And it matters how we respond to God's Spirit. God's a person. We're told, don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. We're told, don't grieve the Spirit of God. And we're told in the Scripture, three words, quench not the Spirit. I just know about me. I don't know about you. But I know I'm guilty sometimes. Sometimes God's trying to do something. There's a little fire in me and I, I don't want the fire. See, not now, not time. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to whatever, whatever. But I'm guilty sometimes of quenching the Spirit of God. If we're going to walk in a way that's circumspect, we're going to walk in a way as believers that's pleasing to God and that makes us fruitful, then Christian, we need to walk with the awareness that God lives in us. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And it just isn't a matter of I disagree, I don't like what that person thinks about this or that. It really is a matter of God. And I don't want to quench God's Spirit. So you and I need to be aware. I mean, I'll tell you something. I just, just, just need to think about my words more, don't you? Sometimes I say things, and I, may, I don't mean them a certain way, but I just I don't think about what I say. Sometimes people say things to me, and I don't think about what they say. Just don't think. Somebody tell me something, and I think, oh, that's interesting. I just look at the surface value, but I don't really think about what they're trying to tell me. Or I don't think it matters or means as much. Somebody could say, well, that really hurts. And I think, oh, yeah, really hurt. No, they mean they're really hurt whatever, and, and I don't think about what they say as much. You know, if God's Spirit says something to you, you have to think about what He says. You have to think about what you say to Him. You have to think about how you live and what it does to Him. We don't live in a vacuum, my friend. What we do affects others. And what we do even affects Christ in us, God the Holy Spirit. Let's thank God for what we've learned today we'll finish our service out. Father, today I just want to thank You for Your Word. And God, just this little snippet, this little statement that's just packaged in so many simple commands. God, it's in Your Word. It's profitable to us. And I pray that we profit by it today. Lord, I think that today it's, it's possible that the one who searches the hearts would say of us, you have been quenching my spirit. I wanted to do something. I wanted to say something. I wanted to do a work. But you quenched it. You put it out. You destroyed it. God, I believe that grieves you. And so, that will bother us the way that we treat you. So I pray that if you've shown us specifics about it today, that, Lord, you would not be quenched 
I would pray personally, and I believe I represent this, this, this group today, this church. I would pray personally, God, that there would be a fire in us, that your Holy Spirit would burn in us, that you would speak to us, that you would show us things, that we would listen so we could hear and so we could grow, and ultimately so we could have your power in us. I ask that you bless and move in the invitation today. Before you open your eyes and, and to look up, would you keep your heads, heads bowed and eyes closed momentarily? And the reason for this would be I'd like for us to have a private time. My eyes are open right now. I'm looking. But I wouldn't embarrass you. I wouldn't call you out. And I wouldn't identify you for anything. I don't want you to know that. So I'd like to have a private invitation. And so I would ask that you would respect others' privacy as yours is being respected as well. I'd like to ask, ask a couple of questions in today's invitation. First of all, I'll just tell you what the invitation is. It's a time when we invite you to respond to what God said. I believe God's Spirit's moved today. I believe He's spoken to us individually. Here today, and you would say, Pastor, this series on God's Spirit is something that's shown me that I don't have God's Spirit in me. In other words, I, I'm spiritual, I'm open, attentive to spiritual things. But I've actually never been born again. I don't know that I'm saved. Actually, I know that I'm not saved. And uh, don't embarrass me. Don't call me out. I wouldn't want people to even know that I'm not saved. So don't, don't embarrass me. But God spoke to me about this matter of receiving Jesus as my Savior. It wasn't really what the message was about today, but that's what the message was for me. If you're here this morning and that would be you, uh, would you just slip your hand up and say, you know, Pastor, God God's spoke to me about the matter of my... It's my soul. I haven't received Jesus as my Savior. I'm not saved. Would you slip your hand up? Just slip it up, and when I see it, I'll just slip it right back down, okay? All right? The second part of the invitation would be for those who know that they're saved, they have God's Spirit in them. If you're here this, this afternoon, you would say, well, Pastor, I'm not proud of it, but I'm like just about everybody else. I've not only grieved God's Spirit, but I've quenched God's Spirit. Matter of fact, Matter of fact, right now, with regard to my life and the Spirit of God moving and working, I'd have to say He's pretty much the fire's put out. I've quenched the God's Spirit, and God was God was kind enough, and His Spirit was gentle enough to show me that today. Would you pray for me, Pastor? I've quenched God's Spirit, and I want to do something about it. If that's you, would just slip your hand up. Okay, just slip it up, right back down. Just slip it up, right back down. Okay, anyone else? The invitation this morning is pretty simple. I'm actually going to uh, ask us this morning. We're not going to um, we're not going to sing. I'm going to ask us just to stand, and I'm going to have the, the pianist pick a, uh, an invitation song of her choice. And while she prays, would you just do business with the Lord? It's just going to be real simple this morning. While she prays, would you do business with the Lord? If you need someone to counsel with you, or to open a Bible and answer some questions that maybe the message this morning has. A cause to be asked in your mind. Feel free in the it, to to uh, signal me, and I'll I'll either help you or have someone help you or meet with you afterward. But if God's spoken to you and He's showed you you've quenched God's spirit, you know it's as simple this morning as just saying, God, I don't want to quench your spirit, and so God, I'm gonna I want to ask forgiveness for what I've done. I've confessed it that I've quenched your spirit. I'm asking for forgiveness, and God, I'm gonna live differently. I'm committed that I'm not going to live in a way that quenches your spirit. Whatever the specifics of it are, that's between you and God. He's shown you. And so will you do business with Him as He's shown you? Father, I ask that you would bless and move in the invitation. Now we pray in Jesus' name.